Jones. I'm Joe Heiser, your host, and in this segment, we have a real treat for you. Uh, an old friend, a world traveler, a uh, successful businessman who's uh, traveled around the world, but most recently in his uh, travels has gone to Ukraine. And of course, anyone that's following the news knows that uh, following a revolution there, uh, earlier this year, uh, much trouble of late, especially in eastern Ukraine, where uh, armed rebels are uh, fighting the government, the threat of civil war, perhaps cold war, perhaps a hot war uh, with uh, Russia, and uh, talk about a, a bird's eye view. Uh, joining me, old friend uh, Kevin McRae joins us. Joe, and, good to uh, see you. Privyet Kroska. You are, you are dressed appropriately. <laughs> Comrade Joseph. <laughs> well, Welcome uh, to the People's Republic of Donetsk. Well, yeah, well, believe me. <laughs> um, uh, welcome back. First of all, what what a uh, what a trip. Uh, what uh, first tell us what what led you to go to Ukraine? You were there. First of all, you know, I know you traveled through there before in your yep. travels, mm -hmm. but. Uh, you were there. Murphy's uh, Pub was still there was seven it, years was, later. Was there really? <laughs> right oh on my that, God, right God on, forbid. <laughs> right on the Black Sea. For the uh, Black Maiden sea. Revolution, whatever, in, yeah. in mm -hmm. Kiev. Uh, yeah. The riots, uh, the, uh, the uh, demonstrations that ultimately brought down a president uh, yeah. there, and uh, well, and everything that's happened since. But uh, uh, give us, uh, tell us uh, your story. Well, you know, Joe, anywhere in the world where people are willing to stand up against their corrupt government, I'm with the people. Yeah, that's it. That's, <laughs> you know? how, that's how you landed and so it. Fun pe some people that actually wanted to stand up, I, was, I, uh, I had a few reasons to go to Ukraine. I have some friends there, and uh, as you know, I'm a big opera fan, and there's a beautiful opera house in Kiev. And, uh, and the revolution was there. And of course, January in Boston isn't always the best place <laughs> to be for a contractor like myself. So I said, let's go see some Mozart and join the revolution. Well, and it turns out, and, and what you got there, of course, uh, January, uh, even in Kiev, it's not Moscow, but uh, you needed that hat, right? It was, I was just there, uh, I think you guys have some pictures actually, yep. I was just there in Maiden last weekend, and I had been there in January, out with the rebels, and uh, we had actually stormed a government building the night I was there. And my friend, who was actually afraid to go down to Maiden because you know people are dying and stuff, she commented to me it was a hundred degrees colder when I was in there January. in January than I was there last weekend. It was about ninety degrees. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, of course, you, you've seen so much. And first, uh, let's let's go back to the uh, the revolution. That must have been. Uh, an incredible uh, time there, uh, 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 people of all different stripes and all different uh, uh, ideologies even uh, yeah. mm -hmm. standing up against what they saw as a corrupt government and you know, ultimately when he left they saw some things as well but uh, right. uh, tell, tell us what you saw there on the street. Well it was, it was really interesting, um, there were thousands and thousands of people there and um, and they really were supported by 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 the people. There were girls there with um, with trays that said free cookies, try and hand them out. And old ladies were coming down and bringing tea. And it was really like a bunch of, I mean, West Virginia coal miners or something, except they looked very Russian. And they were there with um, old American hockey helmets and, and literally baseball bats and, and two by fours and just piling up um, tires everywhere with uh, you know flags and ragtag mm -hmm. tents. But they, it, it actually reminded me, believe it or not, it reminded me of Valley Forge of all things. They had real organization uh, they clearly had cell phone. There was a, 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 a command team whenever it looked like the stormtroopers were going to attack from one direction because mm -hmm. there's eight different ways into the square. You know, a column of guys could come running up and um, they really were organized and there was constant entertainment and a, there's a stage right in the center and they had speakers coming and talking and it was really, really impressive and you could tell that the energy of the people standing up for themselves and saying, not necessarily that they know what they want, mm -hmm. 
but they know what they don't want, and that was the incredibly corrupt government. Well, that was of course, there. Uh, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union beco before becoming uh, independent in 1991, and they had already had, had a the revolution, Orange the revolution. Orange Revolution. Yeah. Uh, uh, what made this different, or why did people believe? Uh, and and uh, there were you know many protests before. Sure. Uh, why was this one different? Well, I don't think, to be honest, I don't think it was different. I think the Orange Revolution was to get rid of a corrupt government, and another corrupt government came in. Uh, the the, the uh, woman, I can't think of her name. Uh, Yulia Timonchenko. Yulia, who's the only woman with gonads, as Putin says, in, in the entire Ukrainian politics. And she turned out to be corrupt, and which turns us to today, those protesters are still there, mm -hmm. and and they have said we are going to stay here to keep an eye on these guys because it's just and as you know the new president is just another billionaire right. oligarch yep. and speaking to people there they don't have a lot of particular trust and faith in him either and um, well and there are some temps I I think we've got some photos if we can bring. Uh uh, some of those up, we can see uh, what, what we're talking about, including um, um, Maiden or Maiden Square, however they're pronouncing it. Uh, yeah. uh, and and there you can see uh, that's that's the big Independence Tower there in the background, and you can see that giant uh, protest um, tower on on the side. That's that got, was constructed by that's the constructed by the protesters. Imagine, I mean, that's essentially like you know here at City Hall or at the Public Gardens mm -hmm. or something. And as you I think started to allude to, just this weekend, the new mayor Klitschko, the that's former right. boxer tried to start to clean some of these guys out, and they stood up to him. I was very so surprised, and I, I gotta tell you, Joe, people are like, oh, how bad is it over there? Let me tell you, I saw Ferraris driving around, and Porsches, and Mercedes, and people are going out to dinner, and people are, you know, Kiev's a thriving city of three million people. So it's not like it was paralyzed during not, the... The only problem with the protesters where that's a main dra imagine Commonwealth Ave right, being blocked block off, up, right. and it's, so there's traffic problems around it. But uh, for the most part, the city's just going about, and the country, are just going about their business and hoping that things turn out better. But they've been burned so many times. That, that no one believes? That no one believes. I mean, they're just sort of hoping for uh, Another interesting point is they really seem to have said, we want to be part of Europe. And I think I showed you another picture. Mm -hmm. Everywhere, there's billboards and posters, and people on their cars have flags of, you know, the, the, uh, the round stars that's the symbol of the European Union. They're not part of the European Union any yet, but they clearly want to be part of it. Well, and uh, I don't know if we have any of the other photos, I and mean, we can bring some of them up uh, as we go, but now uh, I've got to ask you about this. Uh, uh, and uh, there we can see you uh, uh, standing. That, <laughs> that's obviously from this summer. Uh, that's from last weekend, Joe. Uh, yeah. It's last Sunday. Well, yeah. uh, there it is. Uh, no uh, hat. And here's another one. Look at this one uh, uh, standing <laughs> amongst the... Uh, the farmland there in Ukraine and as you know Ukraine's known as the breadbasket of Europe and it's really uh, Ukraine's very similar to say Ohio Indiana mm -hmm. and Illinois you go for hunt I went north to south east to west hundreds and hundreds of miles of corn soybeans sunflowers wheat and farmers are going about their business and and people are going about their business. Well, now I got to end. And what about that now? That is that, the, the reason I wanted to show that. So that's one of the main government buildings. Right. And as you see, there's the flag of Ukraine on the left and the flag of the European Union on the right. right. And that's that's why I sent you this picture. It's like it's even on government buildings. I mean, they clearly. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, at least the, the political people in charge clearly want to be part of Europe. My sense is that that's what the mm -hmm. most people want to be part of. Now, of course, uh, uh, Putin uh, suggested that uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, 
revolution, you can see some of the barricades. Those are obviously the barricades right. from uh, that were still up. A number of people died on that street. Yeah. That was one of the big, where one of the big battlegrounds was. Well, yeah. Anyway, let's go back to Putin, who sure. uh, suggested that the, the revolutionary forces who were really, I think he referred to them as fascists. Uh, you know, these uh, right-wing goons that took over and forced out an elected yeah. president. Yeah. And, and, uh, there's two you, sides you, to every you, coin, yeah, well, you know, uh, absolutely. Clearly, but, yeah. you, you know, you would agree, uh, uh, Yanukovych, I believe that's his name, uh, yes. was the mm -hmm. president, was elected yeah. in a, what's perceived as a fair election, yes. relatively yeah. speaking, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, forced from office. And uh, how could, how could, uh, I'm not, I don't know about you, but how could they support the uh, removal of an office with, uh, you know, by extrajudicial means? Let me, let me, if you don't mind, expand this to a global view. I think around the world right now, we're seeing, you know, maybe to bring up Winston Churchill's quote that, you know, democracy's, you know, a terrible form of government. It's just better than everything else we have now. And I think what we're seeing is the limits of democracy in some places. Al Maliki in Iraq was, you know, was elected. Uh, um, Taksin in in Thailand was legally elected, and this guy was legally elected. And a, a lot of times, what's happening is, is you know, 53 percent of the vote comes in, and this guy and the the elected leader. Mm -hmm takes control, you know, and and uh, and rapes the country or, or does things that are not good for the country overall, but might be good for their party or just themselves. Mm -hmm. And people aren't sure what to do. I mean, it's a very, it's a fascinating question, and I agree with you. I, I think people... So does it make you a little uncomfortable? Because, uh, you know, you're uh, first and foremost a, a guy that's always believed in you know, the making rule of the law. process, the rule of law, making it work. Uh, you yeah. worked uh, all your uh, life here and uh, all your time here in Boston trying to make that uh, come true. Uh, sure. And uh, well, we know what Thomas make, Jefferson uh, said, right? <laughs> Every twenty years, the blood of patriots and tyrants needs to be spilled. You know. Well, but and I think he, in in all seriousness, mm -hmm. I think two hundred years ago he saw what the limits of you know. 51% wins an election, and then they can treat the other 49% like essentially minions. And that's not, you know, a workable form of government. And, and, um, and I think it, the other thing that Jefferson talked about is you really need an informed electorate. And as you know, I've traveled around the world and I talked to people, I obviously talked to lots of people in this country. I'm just constantly amazed at how People don't know what's going on. And well, I, re I remember sorry. you saying, uh, you, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Kevin uh, uh, took a uh, around-the-world motorcycle ride on your, your honeymoon. And I, I recall uh, you telling me that maybe the most corrupt place that you went through in all those travels was traveling through essentially Ukraine or a portion of... Uh, uh, Moldova, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, Moldova, what what was Moldova, which still is technically, and and uh, is it better now? Transdenister? No, no, when, <laughs> that I the don't world know, corruption. When when you were in uh, Ukraine, uh, I was, I, you know, I couldn't really you, say to be yeah, honest. Yeah. I was only there for. I, I think that um, you know, I, one of the things that a lesson to have learned from this Ukraine thing is that, as I was saying earlier. Life just goes on. Uh, you know, I was just talking, I was Skyping with a friend of mine in, in Poltava, a city of maybe 250 miles from the fighting, and uh, she works in a hospital, she's an attorney, and uh, in her Soviet era building, they're not gonna have hot water for a week because the Russians are cutting off their gas, but people still go about their business. It's really amazing sometimes what people put up with in other countries that we here in the United States like wouldn't tolerate. But what about that though? Now I, let's talk a little bit about what's what's going on in East U Ukraine. Now you weren't yeah. near the front. Two hundred uh, miles away. Two hundred miles away. I couldn't get any of my friends. Believe me, I I, you I, hopped on a I brought my <laughs> Leatherman. I was ready to fight the Soviets. You know, <laughs> but um, what I think pe people over there genuinely. Uh, everyone understands this is Putin's war. Pa Putin's all over this. People respect Putin. Uh, they think he's 
you know. Why? This, he's the smartest politician out there. Putin is he's just playing a game. It's a game of cards to him. And by basically saying to a you know, low-level National Guard Russian guy, sent a few of these guys saying, hey, why don't you go over to Donetsk and Luhansk and stir up some There's trouble. There's a couple of rockets. Here's some rockets. Here's some AK-47s. We'll get you stuff. We'll support you as much as we can. F you know, there's a bunch of Russian-speaking people mm -hmm. there. They're not... The people there see Russia is stronger than Ukraine. Uh, you know, the Ukraine has been more corrupt and more a failure than Russia has been. I mean, do you want to be with a failed, a completely failed mm -hmm. state or a, a strong leader state that's doing better economically? And, I mean, I met people that are Ukrainian, that are working in Moscow because the money's better there, two or three times better. The average Ukrainian makes about $350 a month, and, and that's for a college-educated person. So to answer your question about what's going on, Putin quietly or under the table mm -hmm. supporting these rebels might get to take another big land grab. And if he loses, it's not his head that's going to get mm -hmm. cut off. It's a bunch of low-level National Guard guys playing soldier. And so it's almost a, a no-lose gambit for Putin. Is, is there a concern, of course, uh, you know, there's... Uh, pitched battles going on around sure. uh, Donetsk, uh, Luhansk, uh, some of these uh, uh, major cities in eastern Ukraine that uh, this could explode into a much bigger thing? I, I'd be no, I, there, there's no chance that, you have my word on it, <laughs> and you know I'm never wrong, <laughs> but, there's, <laughs> but there's no chance that Russia would go much past any of the areas that were the, the, at the biggest part of the expansion. And the reason is, is, is after Notwithstanding what happened in Crimea. Yeah. What, the thing is, as you know, Crimea has been the Russian naval base for 300 years. I mean, they have real, reason, real global political reasons, strategic reasons to be in Crimea. Is that how you got that hat? Uh, Joe, I can't tell you how I got this hat, you know. <laughs> you have to look at the FBI file to see that. But, but a, a bit past where, that, where the fighting is going on now, it becomes much more ethnically Ukrainian, whereas that area has been, you know, is very mixed. It's a very mixed place. Uh, you know, everybody speaks Ukrainian and Russian. Um, there's like I said, economic ties back and forth. That area in the east and the south along the Black Sea is more ethnically Russian. But basically, central Ukraine is more Ukrainian. And Putin knows, I mean, if he tried to do that, NATO would get involved and Obama would get involved. But, you know, if he quietly, I've called this a civilized war as opposed to what's going on in the Middle East, for right. example. There's very few um, civilians getting killed. It's, it's soldier versus uh, soldier. Different kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Now, what has this uh, taught you? You, of course, uh, ran for mayor here and uh, talked about how corrupt you thought the city of Boston was at the yeah. time. What has this experience shown you about that? And... Uh, are we changing, or are there uh, other changes that uh, we should be seeing here? Well, I think that um, it, it was interesting. My grandmother raised seven children on a farm in Illinois during World War II, and I spent one Thanksgiving interviewing her on videotape to memorialize it. And I remember asking her, you know, during World War II, were you afraid of the Germans? Were you afraid of the Nazis? You know, because I grew up with all the World War II yeah. movies, and I was scared to yeah. death of the stormtroopers. And she said, I was very surprised. She goes, no, I didn't really, it didn't really affect, you know, here she is in Central America. Yeah. You know, there, no way the Nazis were ever going to come to Illinois, I guess. Yeah. And I think that's what was very surprising to me. I happened to be in Lviv, a, a, a town you probably know in, in uh, western Ukraine. Happened to be their Super Bowl mm -hmm. that day, their big football match. It was Dynamo Kiev versus Donetsk, actually. Yeah. And there was 60,000 people there. Soccer is king. And there's people 
marching in the streets and celebrating and there was a war going on and you know and we were like oh what's going on it's terrible people are going to restaurants I was just at this nightclub on the Black Sea a thousand people the band went on at 2 30 in the morning dancing on the beaches on the tables <laughs> on the tables in the pools you know everything and it's like people aren't sitting there as I say to people how many people do you know that fought in Afghanistan in the last 10 years? I know personally, I only know one person. Did you, did, when you woke up in the morning in the last 10 years, did you check the news to see what was happening in Kabul or southern mm -hmm. Afghanistan? Or, you know, it, you, you got up, you have a job, you went to there, you've been raising your kids, you're involved in city government. You didn't check what was going on in Afghanistan every day. The vast majority of the people in the Ukraine are, you know, oh, Ten people died today. Oh, that's very sad. I still got to make a buck. I got to take care of my family. And something that I think is hard for Americans to realize is, you know, all the people in the Ukraine that are my age, they were part of this country when they grew up, yeah, you know? And, and they learned the Soviet songs yeah. and this growing up, and then they learned the Ukrainian songs, and maybe they'll go back to Russian okay. songs. But now, now, now come back. Because, okay. uh, of course, some of the things that you were talking about when you ran for mayor, uh, well, there's a recent audit out now on the BRA that shows... That uh, Kevin was right about that, everything. That, that, well, I don't about <laughs> everything, but you were, but, yeah, you but were, you were right about editorial it. Editorial in the Boston Globe. BRA not, needs transparency. Right, right, right. Uh, was that my yeah, word? Transparency? I, you feel, are you feeling vindicated? Uh, no. Or I mean, after seeing the level of corruption over there, does this all kind of pale? No, I think that, um, you know, I'm a big picture type of person. I really do think about what is, how do we make democracies work, whether it's in Boston or the mm -hmm. Ukraine. And I do, I go back to that word transparency. You know, the citizens have a right to know where their money's being spent and how decisions are being made. You know, the recent state house corruption thing. How can any state legislature legislate? As you know, they exempt themselves from the open meeting law. How can they possibly say they care about openness and transparency when they exempt themselves from that sort of stuff, you know? But help me, because uh, sure. we've got just a couple minutes left. Yeah. That experience uh, make you more aware or more uh, determined, or do you just kind of say, well, compared to what do you see in some you do of, these other, you one of these other countries and you know it's not so bad here you do appreciate the united states yeah. i mean we do have a, a better rule of of law here but um i actually thought people in the ukraine were at least equivalently happy as boston mm -hmm. life in america is tough too this is an expensive be. place to yeah. live yeah. it's a tough place boston's a tough town we don't suffer fools yeah. And there's good and bad everywhere. And anybody that thinks that we have all the solutions here in Boston or Massachusetts is fooling themselves. No. And uh, we're just about out of time. I know one of your uh, causes that's uh, near and dear to you, a big, uh, big uh, fundraiser coming up. Put uh, on the other hat. Ah, uh, there it is, your <laughs> other hat. Uh, we're talking about, the, of course, the uh, Travis Roy Foundation. And uh, tell us what's happening. Give us your pick. Sure. So. Um, I'm, I've been involved with the Travis Roy Foundation. As you know, he was the uh, student at BU that uh, was paralyzed 11 seconds into his first shift for the varsity hockey team there. And he's set up a foundation, travisroyfoundation.org. And the second weekend in August every year, 24 teams from around New England and one team of Yankees from New York come yeah. up. And this great guy, Pat O'Connor, has built a miniature Fenway Park and a mini Wrigley Field in his backyard, and we play wiffle ball, and we raise hundreds of thousands of dollars. We hope to make $500,000 wow. this year that Travis spends half the money on medical research and the other half on people that have had injuries right. like him making their life better. And if people could go to travisroyfoundation.org. And, and I, I think and we've got it on the screen there. Great. So, uh, and if they could donate uh, 10 20 30 dollars mm -hmm. it would be really appreciated uh, great organization travis was a great guy and i'm i'm really proud i'm taking a bunch of i've how's taken, your team do 
Uh, I, t I take a bunch of inner city kids from, uh, uh, from the south end. I've got one kid from West Roxbury I just found out today is going to come up. We have a lot of fun. Actually, there's a team called the Boston Beef, a bunch of lawyers. They're three-time champions. They won last year. Big fundraisers. and uh, well, Maybe not this year. And it's free to anybody. If you, you want to come up to northern Again. Vermont and uh, have a great time this weekend, come on up. TravisRoyFoundation.org. My good friend Kevin McRae, back from Ukraine, sharing his experiences there. As always, I love Joe, having great you here. To see you. Thanks so much for coming in and sharing with us. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. You're watching Talking the Neighborhoods, and we're here tonight and every Monday night. At the same time, we'll be back next week. Uh, more uh, joining us, uh, Deb Goldberg, another of the candidates running for state treasurer, and also uh, uh, an update on the state convention center authority with Jim Rooney. All that and more next week. Stay tuned.